Good morning, class. Today, I'm going to be recording uh, lit speed building. And so let me give you some words that come out. It's 170 to 190. You have Polish proverb. You have swims technique of shorthand reporting. You have competition, dictation, accuracy, round robin, appendix, how often, notebook, knowledge, vocabulary, unfamiliar. So it's on machine shorthand. So let me write some of these words. You have shorthand is S, hand. Okay, S hand for shorthand. You've got, um, Report is wart, come back G, reporting. And then you have arbitrary, arbitrary, two strokes. You have inst instantaneous, is instantaneous, three, four strokes. You have competition, competition, two strokes. And let me go back up here, bring up my notes, and this is gonna be at 170 for five minutes, okay? Here we go. There is a Polish proverb, if is king, if a short form occurs frequently, if it does not conflict with any of the other outlines, if it is not so awkward to write that it slows you down anyway, and if you attempt no other short forms until the execution of this one is completely automatic, then if you want to adopt this particular short form, more power to you. But the core of this shorthand speed is your instantaneous reaction to all sorts of dictated material containing all sorts of infrequently encountered words. Any arbitrary outline that gives you even split second pause that makes you fumble during the course of dictation or is in any way distracting to you is a roadblock on your way to speed. Again, quoting from Swim's technique of shorthand reporting, more young writers ambitious to reach reporting ability have had their speed retarded and sometimes permanently so by an overemphasis placed on shorthand expedience than by any other single training mistake. If you want to shorten your system of writing, we suggest that you review the shortening principles that are taught in your basic system and apply them carefully where they are applicable. Competition helps. There is something stimulating about having even one person compete with you in a practice session. And the more people you have in such a group, the greater will be the incentive to exert yourself to the very utmost during the dictation so that you can read back later with commendable accuracy. That is one reason why a class in school is the best place to get your dictation practice. But if that is impracticable, then a group of reporters can get together for practice sessions. When the tape dictation has been exhausted, this group of reporters can do an excellent job of building each other's speed if they will share the chore of preparing further dictation material according to the recommendations in the appendix and then dictate to each other in round robin sessions. If it is impossible to arrange for group sessions, it will still be very worthwhile to have a friend or relative dictate to you at your most efficient dictation speed. If a friend or relative cannot meet you at stated times, he or she might even put the dictation or tape from which you can practice later at your convenience. If this is too impractical, you will get very fine practice indeed by putting dictation on yourself. Sometimes a combination of all these methods is possible and profitable. Optimum practice schedule. How often should you practice and for how long a stretch at a time? Two of three five minute takes a day Reading back completely each time against the text is the minimum amount of effort required for speed building. If you have time for more 
up to eight takes a day are well worth the effort. And still more practice should build your speed all the faster. If your speed time is limited and you are able to get in, say, 12 five-minute takes a week, it is better to spread them to two a day rather than do three or four on some days and skip or skimp on others. In our experience, the best time of the day to practice is the morning. This may vary, of course, with the individual and his or her schedule. But no matter when you practice, as long as you can put forth the effort to concentrate, you will get good results. Keep a notebook. We recommend that you keep a notebook of your progress. Divide a page into four columns, noting the date, type of material dictated, the speed at which it was actually dictated, and the number of errors you make. Another section of the book might be devoted to conflicts you discovered on reading back and the outlines you adopted to avoid them. A section might be devoted to words you found difficult to write or to read back correctly. You might also list vocabulary that is new to you that you want to remember. Knowledge of subject matter. We have mentioned that familiarity with your notes is an aid to accuracy in reading back. Another aid to accuracy in reading back is familiarity with the English vocabulary and the ideas expressed in the dictation material. Even while written outlines may be difficult to read, especially in a literary or legal take if you are not familiar with the vocabulary and the ideas expressed. This knowledge of vocabulary and context is very useful not only for reading your notes, but even more for writing your notes in the first place. When you hear unfamiliar words of familiar words and unexpected arrangements, the concentration that you should be focusing on your writing is diverted to the task of hearing and comprehending. An unfamiliar word is heard in separate parts almost as nonsense syllables instead of a unit. You have to struggle with the natural reaction. Did I hear it correctly? What does it mean? You expend more mental energy and work harder than if you had done beforehand the work of learning the unfamiliar words and phrases. Education is like, okay, so let me write some words for you all. You have education is EGS, EGS, education. You have, let's see, vocabulary, vocabulary, okay, three strokes. You have individual is V-I-J, Vig. You have Recommend is R-E-M-D, R-E-M-D, recommend. Convenience is Veens, V long E-N-S, Veens for convenience. Commendable, commend is K-M-E-N-D and then B-L, commend both. You've got Polish, just two strokes, Pol, I-R-B, Polish. Okay, and let me see. And here are some of the words, okay? This is going to be at 180. There is a Polish proverb, if is king. If a short form occurs frequently, if it does not conflict with any of your other outlines, if it is not so awkward to write that it slows you down anyway, and if you attempt no other short forms until the execution of this one is completely automatic, then if you want to adopt this particular short form, more power to you. But the core of this shorthand speed is your instantaneous reaction to all sorts of dictated material containing all sorts of infrequently encountered words. Any arbitrary outline that gives you even split second pause that makes you fumble during the course of dictation or is any in any way distracting to you as a roadblock on your way to succeed. Again, quoting from Swen's technique of shorthand reporting. More young writers ambitious to reach reporting ability have had their speed retarded. 
and sometimes permanently so by an overemphasis placed on shorthand expedience than by any other single training mistake. If you want to shorten your system of writing, we suggest that you review the shortening principles that are taught in your basic system and apply them carefully where they are applicable. Competition helps. There is something stimulating about having even one person compete with you in a practice session. And the more people you have in such a group, the greater will be the incentive to exert yourself in the utmost during the dictation so that you can read back later with commendable accuracy. That is one reason why a class in school is the best place to get your dictation practice. But if that is impracticable, then a group of reporters can get together for practice sessions. When the tape dictation has been exhausted, this group of reporters can do an excellent job of building each other's speed if they will share the chore of preparing for their dictation material according to the recommendations in the appendix and, and dictate to each other in round robin sessions. If it is impossible to arrange for group sessions, it will still be very worthwhile to have a friend or relative dictate to you at your most efficient dictation speed. If a friend or relative cannot meet you at stated times, he or she might even put the dictation on tape from which you can practice later at your convenience. If this is too impractical, you will still get very fine practice indeed by putting the dictation on tape yourself. Sometimes a combination of all these methods is possible and profitable. Optimum practice schedule. How often should you practice and for how long a stretch at a time? Two or three five minute takes a day, reading back completely each time against the text is the minimum amount of effort required for speed building. If you have time for more up to eight takes a day are well worth the effort and still more practice should build your speed all the faster. If your time is limited and you're able to get in say 12 five minute takes a week, it is better to spread them to two a day rather than do three or four on some days and skip or skimp on others. In our experience, the best time of day to practice is the morning. This may vary, of course, with the individual and his or her schedule, but no matter when you practice, as long as you can put forth the effort to concentrate, you will get good results. Keep a notebook. We recommend that you keep a notebook of your progress, divide a page into four columns, noting the date, type of material dictated, the speed at which it was actually dictated, and the number of errors you make Another section of the book might be <coughs> devoted to conflicts you discovered on reading back and the outlines you adopted to avoid them. A section might be devoted to words you found difficult to write or to read back correctly. You might also list vocabulary that is new to you that you want to remember. Knowledge of subject matter. We have mentioned that familiarity with your notes is an aid to accuracy in reading back. Another aid to accuracy in reading back is familiarity with the English vocabulary and the ideas expressed in the dictation material. Even while written outlines may be difficult to read, especially in a literary or legal tape, if you are not familiar with the vocabulary and the ideas expressed, this knowledge of vocabulary and context is very useful not only for reading your notes, but even more for writing your notes in the first place. When you hear unfamiliar words, of familiar words and unexpected arrangements, the concentration that you should be focusing on your writing is diverted to the task of hearing and comprehending. An unfamiliar word is heard in separate parts almost as nonsense syllables instead of as a unit. You have to struggle with the natural reaction. Did I hear it correctly? What does it mean? You expend more mental energy and work harder than if you had done beforehand the work of learning the unfamiliar words and phrases. Education is like money in the bank. It helps you over the rough spots. Okay, and so let me see some words that come out. You have, um, let me just minimize the screen so you all can see. Words that come out, expedience. Did I, I don't think I wrote that expedience. Um, According to, K-A-O-R-G-T, efficient, F-I-R-B-T, F-I-R-B-T. You've got 
And so profitable, profitable. This will be at 190. There is a Polish proverb, if is king. If a short form occurs frequently, if it does not conflict with any of your other outlines, if it is not so awkward to write that it slows you down anyway, and if you attempt no other short forms until the execution of this one is completely automatic, then if you want to adopt this particular short form, more power to you. But the core of this shorthand speed is your instantaneous reaction to all sorts of dictated material, containing all sorts of infrequently encountered words, any arbitrary outline that gives you even split second pause that makes you fumble during the course of dictation or is in any way distracting to you is a roadblock on your way to speak. Again, quoting from Swen's technique of shorthand reporting, more young writers ambitious to reach reporting ability have had their speed retarded and sometimes permanently so by an overemphasis placed on shorthand expedience than by any other single training mistake. If you want to shorten your system of writing, we suggest that you review the shortening principles that are taught in your basic system and apply them carefully where they are applicable. Competition helps. There is something stimulating about having even one person compete with you in a practice session. And the more people you have in such a group, the greater will be the incentive to exert yourself to the very utmost during the dictation so that you can read back later with commendable accuracy. That is one reason why a class in school is the best place to get your dictation practice. But if that is impracticable, then a group of reporters can get together for practice sessions. When the tape dictation has been exhausted, this group of reporters can do an excellent job of building each other's speed if they will share the shore of preparing further dictation material according to the recommendations in the appendix and then dictate to each other in round robin sessions. If it is impossible to arrange for group sessions, it will still be very worthwhile to have a friend or relative dictate to you at your most efficient dictation speed. If a friend or relative cannot meet you at stated times, he or she even might put the dictation on tape from which you can practice later at your convenience. If this is too impractical, you will still get very fine practice indeed by putting the dictation on tape yourself. Sometimes a combination of all these methods is possible and profitable. Optimum practice schedule. How often should you practice and for how long a stretch at a time? Two of three five-minute takes is a, a day is reading back completely each time that against the text is the minimum amount of effort required for speed building. If you have time for more, up to eight takes a day are well worth the effort. And still more practice build your speed all the faster. If your time is limited and you are able to get in, say, 12 five-minute takes a week, it is better to spread them to to a day rather than do three or four on some days and skip or skimp on others. In our experience, the best time of day to practice is the morning. This may vary, of course, with the individual and his or her schedule, but no matter when you practice, as long as you can put forth the effort to concentrate, you will get good results. Keep a notebook. We recommend that you keep a notebook of your progress. Divide a page into four columns, noting the date, type of material dictated, the speed at which it was actually dictated and the number of errors you make. Another section of the book might be devoted to conflicts you discovered on reading back and the outlines you adopted to avoid them. A section might be devoted to words you found difficult to write or to read back correctly. You might also list vocabulary that is new to you and that you want to remember. Knowledge of subject matter. We have mentioned that familiarity with your notes is an aid to accuracy in reading back Another aid to accuracy in reading back is familiarity with the English vocabulary and the ideas expressed in the dictation material. Even while written outlines may be difficult to read, especially in a literary or legal take, if you are not familiar with the vocabulary and the ideas expressed. This knowledge of vocabulary and context is very useful, not only for reading your notes, but even more for writing your notes in the first place. When you hear unfamiliar words of familiar words and unexpected arrangements, the concentration that you should be focusing on your writing is diverted to the task of hearing and comprehending. 
an unfamiliar word is heard in separate parts almost as nonsense syllables instead of as a unit. You have to struggle with the natural reaction. Did I hear it correctly? What does it mean? You expend more mental energy and work harder than if you had done before the work of learning the unfamiliar words and phrases. Education is like money in the bank. It helps you over the rough spots. Okay, and so we'll get ready for your mock, you all. I'll start with one minute at 180. And let me see, this is for practice. It's gonna be 180, okay? You may be tempted to create special short forms for the more difficult words and phrases of an often repeated take, short forms which could rarely occur outside of the artificial repetition and which would later get rusty with disuse. For the purposes of this discussion, we assume that you have had already mastered your basic stenotype or shorthand system, which means you have achieved a speed of approximately 150 words per minute. Former national champion Charles L. Swim in the technique of shorthand reporting advised his fellow pen writers, when you have reached the speed of 150 words a minute, then I think you can quit repetition practice altogether and commence to write everything but only once and that at your best speed. No matter how fast you learn to write, do not fail in reading back to correct any error in outline or phrase that you have made. We must distinguish between the same subject matter and the same identical take. Many takes of fresh dictation material can be obtained from the same subject matter and profitably used. The same cannot be said. And then you have your 180 lift, proper names. You've got Karen Reinhardt, Ho, and Karen. So this will be 180 lit for five minutes, okay, for your mock. Just a minute. Okay, this is 180 lit for your mock, you all. Some of you know why I stand before you today. Some of you, no surprise, really have no idea. Now, the way I'm going to put my view on love into perspective for you is like this. Let's pretend that we use this bottle of water to represent a relationship. This food coloring is sex. The oil is mutual friendship that should come first. If I throw a bunch of stones into this bottle, the water will overflow, and let's say that the stones represent the driving force of sex. Now, if you will notice, the bottle fogs up, and to me, what that symbolizes is that sex right away with someone you hardly know can completely cloud the real meaning of your relationship. Now, let's ignore the oil for a minute. I want to get to the point of this speech. We all have very differing views on what love is. To start this off, let me ask this question. Are we willing, are we living in love or in lust? I guarantee you most of you will say love, but I speak truly to you that lust is the real thing we have been experiencing for the most part. From a guy's perspective, if you try but can't get, you're a desperate dude. If you try and always get, you're a player. If you have no interest in girls, you are a geek. If you don't have enough friends, you're a loner. If you have a bunch of friends, you're a pleaser. No matter what guys do, we can't avoid the tightening grip that the world has put on us. And to make matters worse, we aren't supposed to show our feelings too often or get too worked up about stuff that really bothers us. I think girls have it even worse though. If you don't date, you're alone forever. If you date too much, you're a slut. If you don't have any guy friends, you're a loner. If you do have guy friends, you're a hoe. If you don't say what you think, you're too sensitive. If you say what you think, you're a bitch. If you don't hang with a bunch of girls, you are antisocial. If you do too much, you're just a pleaser. 
girls are in the same shoes as guys, but the way other girls bring it down on them is way harsher. Why do girls treat other girls the crappy way they do? Why do girls hate so bad on other girls? Not many young people have the courage to call each other out on bad behavior. Not many of us have the courage due to the fact that peer pressure is overwhelming us at this age. But think about where this is going and what could happen if we don't speak up when we see something going on that we know is wrong. Bullying is a problem everywhere in the world, but especially in middle school and high school. If you came up in my mom's generation, there is a good chance you were told that bullying is just a part of growing up and that the best way to deal with it is to stand up to the bully. My mom has some pretty good stories about the time she had to fight in school. She got into a fight once in the eighth grade with a girl named Karen Reinhardt who had been trying to pick fights with my mom since the seventh grade when my mom accidentally hit her in the face with a basketball. Karen's reputation as a bully was known all over the school and her three brothers were bullies too. It seems like that happens a lot in one family that there will be more than one bully. Anyhow, one day at school, my mom said she couldn't take it any longer and was sick and tired of getting hassled by Karen. So she told her to meet her at the creek after school was out. As much as my mom dreaded it, she knew that the only way to make Karen leave her alone was to fight her. And even if she lost, at least that might end the constant stress she felt at school. Turned out that my mom was able to fight better than she realized. And she gave Karen a black eye. And both of them were suspended from school for three days. After that, Karen never once bothered my mom again. A lot of adults will tell school kids to let it go or tell an adult but what the adults don't realize is that if a kid is getting bullied and they tell a teacher and adult, then they are going to get bullied even worse for not handling it themselves. I know the new thinking is to peacefully resolve the issue and let adults in your life help you. But I know from my own experience and not just my mom's that doing that can really backfire and make your life even worse than it was before. It's pretty simple. There are a lot of people in the world who won't respect you if you try to reason with them or try to talk to them about why they want to mess with you. And talking to them or ratting them out is not going to stop the... And then we'll get ready for one minute at 200 jury charge for practice. This is one minute 200 jury charge practice. Madam Foreman, and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you will of course bear in mind that the defendant has pleaded not guilty and by that plea, the defendant denies all the charges. This defendant and no defendant in any court in the United States is not required to prove his innocence. For as you can readily ascertain, it is sometimes impossible for a person to prove his innocence and that is why under our system of jurisprudence, it is incumbent upon the state to prove the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as I previously explained that term to you. I also tell you that the fact that a defendant does not testify on his own behalf cannot and must not be considered against him under any circumstance or in any manner whatsoever. The failure of any defendant to take the witness stand and testify on his own behalf does not create any presumption against him. I tell you that you must not allow that to weigh in the slightest degree against the defendant. The fact that the defendant did not testify should not enter into your discussions or deliberations at all in any manner whatsoever. I told you, and you have proper names on your 200 jury charge, Carl Sampson, Exhibit 6. And this is going to be jury charge for your mock at 200 for five minutes, you all. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The issues we are involved with here in this particular case are fraud and deceit. And this is defined as false statements of a material fact in a transaction which are made by one party against another party. These would be made with the knowledge of their falsity and with the distinct and certain intention that the other party will act on them. When another party believes such statements and bases, 
these decisions on them, then such statements are fraud when used to cause another party to enter into a contract or a deal. In cases such as this, the statements allow the party injured to recover damages. Fraud is never presumed. It must always be proved by the party who is asserting that fraud is present. That person in this case is the plaintiff. The plaintiff must prove by the preponderance or the greater weight of the evidence that he was defrauded. If you think that the evidence weighs such that the preponderance rests on the side of the plaintiff, then you will find your verdict in favor of the plaintiff. If the evidence is equally balanced on either side, then you will not find in plaintiff's favor. It is necessary for the party claiming that he was defrauded to prove that he believed and relied upon the false statements made by the other party in the deal. If that is not the case and the party claiming fraud did have access to the real facts in regard to the transaction in question here and relied on his own data and knowledge of those facts, then there is no fraud. Now, in this particular case, there is no fraud regarding the contents of the agreement because it is admitted by the plaintiff that Carl Sampson read the agreement to him and was familiar with the contents of it. He was not deceived as to what the agreement said. The only question here is if the defendants did then agree to execute a promissory note for $40,000 delivered as Exhibit 6, holding it out as such note and stated by Sampson that Exhibit 6 was the note for $40,000. Under the circumstances I have given to you, if you find and believe from the evidence that the defendant Samson representing the defendants at the time of the making of the settlement represented and stated that the defendants would execute to the plaintiff a note for $40,000 and that later they delivered to the plaintiff that Exhibit 6 was a promissory note for $40,000, then you will find a verdict in the plaintiff's favor for $40,000 with interest added. This is only if you also find that you believe the statements and the making of Exhibit 6 were done for the purpose of cheating and defrauding the plaintiff as claimed here. Conversely, if you do not so find from the preponderance of the evidence, or if you find that the evidence is equally balanced on these issues named above, then you will find a verdict in defendant's favor of no cause of action. In order to find in defendant's favor, you must also believe that the fraudulent representations as claimed by the plaintiff were not made. Also, you must believe that the plaintiff knew the contents and terms of Exhibit 6 at the time of receiving it. If you should find a verdict in defendant's favor in this case, ladies and gentlemen, it will be the usual verdict of no cause of action. If you should arrive at a verdict in favor of the plaintiffs, it will be for the full amount discussed above of $40,000 with interest added as stated in Exhibit 6. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you must put aside all prejudice and pity you may feel for either of the parties in this case and return a fair and just verdict. If you find yourselves em empathizing with one side or the other in this case, you must stop immediately. If you find that you cannot deliberate on the case without bias or prejudice because of experiences of your own, you must come and talk to me. I will decide whether you may need to be excused from this jury or not. I realize that this has been a long and tedious case. I appreciate your attention and your patience. I would like to call to your attention that this case should not be discussed with anyone. The only place you should discuss this case is in the jury room where you will retire to deliberate. You should not even discuss the case with your fellow juror, except in that room during your deliberations. When you reach the point in this process where you are voting, you should always review the views and opinions of the other jurors, especially if there are a number of them. However, you should never give up your own opinion if you are convinced it is correct. What the other jurors believe is important only in that it may cause you to review your opinion or rethink it if you are the only juror or one or two or three who felt a certain way. What I think about the outcome of this case makes no difference at all. I often make comments about the testimony of different witnesses. You must ignore what I may have said or any facial gesture or any gesture I may have made with my hands that would cause you to believe that I have any opinion about the outcome of this matter. I am not allowed to entertain an opinion. The facts in this case are your province, and just as you may not invade my province when it comes to deciding the law, I may not invade yours when it comes to deciding the facts. You must select one of your number to act as your foreman while you are... Okay, and we'll get ready for your Q&A portion. So this is going to be then 
um, one minute at 2.25, and it's Q&A. Okay. What did you do then, Sherry? Me and my little sister, we got in the... Well, just settle down, Sherry. Sherry, let me ask you this. Now, when you saw this thing going on, where was it taking place? Do you remember that? When we got slapped and all? That is right. We were on the outside. My father was at the side of the fence. It happened on the side out that way, but it would be on this side. On this picture? Yes, sir. You want to come down and show it, Sherry, where it would be? Right in here. Now, stand aside where all the jury can see where you are pointing. All right. Now, after you were slapped, what did you do then? Me and my little sister, we went into the van and hit. We were scared, and we hid in the van. And then we, and we, last thing we heard was gunshots go off. Were gunshots. Do you remember what happened then? Yes, sir. Was it upsetting to you and your little sister? Yes, sir. Were you crying? Yes, sir. Okay, where did you go when you left the auto auction? We went down to the gas station and we left our Pontiac there, and then we got some people to come and get it the next day. And? And so you have on your 225 Q&A, um, Richard Tyler, Gresh, Mr. Gresh, Lord Battle Creek, Ann Arbor, and parishioners. This is going to be 225 Q&A for your mock. And it starts at the very beginning cap court as well when you can replace judge. State your name for the court and jury. Richard Tyler, that's spelled T-Y-L-E-R. Did you ever go back to the scene where this collision occurred like the day after or any time afterwards? I know that the next time I was in town I did. How long was that after the collision? A month. Were you there for any particular reason? Did you go back to investigate this or look at that intersection for that reason, or were you just driving by? I was just driving by. So you didn't stop and get out of your car? No. Did you ever look for skid marks after the collision? I noticed that there weren't any. Yes, I guess I did look then. You got out of your car and walked around behind the Gresh vehicle and looked. Is that your testimony? I didn't get behind the car. I just noticed when I got back, back into my car that there weren't any skid marks. Is it possible that the Gresh vehicle was going to the speed limit? No, that's not my recollection. I understand what you've said. I think you said as high as 50 miles per hour. I'm saying is it possible that you're wrong about that and with seeing the Gresh vehicle four seconds prior to the impeding collision that your judgment was wrong and that he was going the speed limit. I don't understand your question. Will you answer my question? Do you think it's possible that the Gresh vehicle was going the speed limit? Not to my recollection. Your answer to interrogatories indicates that you were three feet out into his lane. Is that correct? Yes, approximately. Again, that was your estimate. Yes. Is it possible that you were out as far as five or six feet or half of the lane? It's not possible that I was halfway out into the lane, no. I'm again looking at your statement. It states, Mr. Gresh got out of his car and asked if we were okay. I said to him, why weren't you watching where you were going? Did you say that to Mr. Gresh? Yes. What did he say to you? I don't recall his answer. Do you recall anything he said to you? The only thing I recall is him asking if we were okay when he got out, and then his last statement after we exited the police car. He was heading back to his car saying, I just thank the Lord no one was hurt. Was anybody in your vehicle injured? No. Did anybody in your vehicle ever seek medical attention as a result of this collision? No. Were the three of you wearing it in these seatbelts? Yes. Do you have shoulder belts in your automobile or just the lap belts? The front two seats have shoulder belts. I'm not certain about the seat behind the driver's seat. Did you see Mr. Gresh get out of his vehicle? Yes. Did he appear to be upset or shaken at any point there after the collision? No more upset than anybody would be when they just had an accident. Are you still upset or driving your vehicle? Yes. It was repaired, in other words, in Battle Creek. Is that correct? Yes. How long had you owned that vehicle? Approximately eight months. Had you worked all day? The accident report shows this occurred on a Friday. Does that square with your recollection? Yes. Had you worked all day that day? No. Was this wedding rehearsal at the church the first thing you've done as far as work-related activities on that date? I'm trying to find out what you did all day that day. We were vacationing for the most part, so we probably visited with friends that day. The only thing work-related I did was, I believe I may have met with that couple around lunch to go over a few things on the wedding ceremony. Were you still living in Battle Creek on the date of this collision, or had you already moved to Ann Arbor? We'd already moved. So you were back visiting friends and to do the wedding. Now, 
Was that somebody you knew? Yes. So you promised them, I take it, that you'd perform the wedding ceremony prior to your movie. No, they had called after. Did you consider them friends? I shouldn't say just parishioners, but were they friends or did you know them just professionally? The groom I knew personally and professionally. Is he still here in town? Yes. What does he do here? I'm not sure. He works for a company that does government contracts. Your attorney provided me with a copy of your insurance policy. At the time of this collision, did you have any other insurance, in other words, umbrella or what we call excess coverage on your vehicle? No. So did you drive that vehicle primarily? In other words, did you have more than one family vehicle and your wife drove one and you drove the other? Yes. Why did you bring that vehicle on vacation? It's the biggest car. Everything was operating in good condition on your automobile that you were driving at the time of the collision? Yes. You received a citation, a traffic control signal legend citation. Did you plead guilty? Did you have a trial? What happened to that? No, I didn't have a trial. I don't recall if I pleaded guilty or no contest. I don't remember how that thing went. How I know I paid the ticket. How long were you on vacation? Like a two week or one week vacation? Two. How many days had you been here on that day of the collision? Had you been here a few days already or was this the first day you were here? No, that was either the second or third day. Have you ever been suspended, denied, or revoked in your driving privileges in any state? No. Have you had any other motor vehicle collisions in the last 10 years from today? I don't believe so. Have you had any moving violations in the last 10 years? Yes. Can you tell me how many approximately? I've had at least one speeding ticket in the last 10 years. Any other moving violations? Not that I can recall. Do you know what's wrong with your eyes? Are you nearsighted or farsighted? I'm not sure. Okay, you were driving a 1990 automobile at the time of the collision, is that correct? Yes. How long have you been operating that vehicle? In other words, did you buy it new? Yes. And was there anything that obstructed your vision of the Gresh vehicle, the Sun, or? Okay, you all, that concludes your mock. Have a great weekend. We'll reconvene next Monday with um, jury charge, okay?